imagine the house is on fire. Everyone is safe, including the pets, but you have got only a few moments to grab a select few books. Which ones would you save? Now, I saw a few other booktubers do this gruesome but interesting uh, exercise, so I thought I would do it for myself. Which 10 books would I save if the house was on fire? These are not necessarily the best books in my collection. These are not necessarily the most expensive ones, but these are the special ones. Books that mean something to me. So join me on a browse through my collection and in a way through my life. And I hope you'll enjoy this video. As always, books will be linked down below in the description. Let's start with the first one, shall we? And the first one is this beautiful edition of The Shepherd's Crown by Terry Pratchett. Now, I am a huge Terry Pratchett fan and this book still gets me. This is the last The Squirrel book Terry Pratchett wrote and it is in a way his goodbye, his farewell to his readers. Now, this is in several ways still a Discworld story with all of the fun and the wit and the silliness. But if you know that this was the last book that he wrote, while knowing he was going to die from Alzheimer's disease, this book will tear you up. There is this undertone of him knowing that this is his farewell um, and this is his way to say thank you, to say goodbye, everything will be all right. And as a reader, it devastated me. And even up to today, this book is emotional for me. This book is my farewell and the farewell of many, many readers with me to a great writer. So yeah, the last Discworld novel ever written, still emotional up to today, The Shepherd's Crown by Terry Pratchett. The next book I would certainly save is my copy of Donna Tartt's The Secret History. Now The Secret History, and I've told this already, is a bit of a tradition for me. I reread this book almost every year. Every autumn, when the weather is changing, when it is gloomy and rainy outside, I sit myself down, have a cup of tea, have a cup of coffee, and read The Secret History. And with each reread, I discover new things in this book. As I change, as my life changes, this book changes with it. And up to today, it is still one of my all-time favorite books to read. Now, this is my Dutch copy of The Secret History, and it has this little dedication, a little message, and I love it when people leave messages in books. I don't annotate myself. I absolutely hate the idea of writing or marking anything in a book, but you can always leave me a personal message. Even when people gift me books from my Amazon wishlist um, and they add this little, this little note that goes with it, I always stick them um, in the front of the book so I will always remember whom uh, gifted me the book and which was the message they wanted to send me. I absolutely adore personal messages. So second book I would absolutely, absolutely save from the flames is my personal copy, my Dutch copy of Donna Tartt's The Secret History. Number three is a bit cheating because it's two books, but they come with the same story. These are two um, antiques, I guess, two uh, very early, I think, third or fourth editions um, of Charles Dickens, and they are Barney Burrage, The Uncommercial Traveler, and Martin Chuzzlewit. Now, I was a strange kid. From the moment that I hit uh, secondary school, around 12, 13, uh, my early teens, I had this fascination with Victorian literature. Dickens, Conan Doyle, Mary Shelley, all those books absolutely fascinated me. Now, I think I was 14 and we were on a family holiday on the island of Crete. Apart from the swimming pool and the sea, I can tell you there is not much to do for a 14 year old on the Greek island of Crete. Now, I was given some pocket money, some spending money, and I had no idea what to spend it on besides ice cream. Until the day I was wandering uh, the little village outside of the hotel and I found this old bookshop. It had this cardboard box um, at the front of the entrance. Uh, it contained all kinds of old books and I found these two. And all of a sudden I knew what I was going to spend my spending money on. So instead of going to the arcade hall or buy ice cream or I don't know whatever, I spent my money on these two books. 
Now they are very nice additions, uh, fully leather bound, they have this embossing, they come with the original illustrations, um, so yeah, I absolutely love them, don't know if they are worth something, but they um, symbolize my strange Victorian uh, obsessitude for me, so yeah, these two are absolutely getting saved. Now the next one is something totally different and it is a big one, it is Lauren Dix Antarctica. Now this is one of those absolutely gorgeous coffee table books that you have to own. The photography in this one is absolutely beautiful. It is an exploration of the uh, ice continent Antarctica, the South Pole, and it is, it is a gorgeous book. If you have any interest in geography, in beautiful photography, if you just want to have a book on a table somewhere that you can open and browse, then absolutely I would recommend this one. But that's not the reason why it's special. This book was actually the inspiration for our honeymoon. Now, normal people um, pick a sunny destination for their honeymoon, perhaps a resort hotel, all you can eat buffet, cocktails, a nice swimming pool, laying down in the sun, maybe reading, just enjoying the surroundings and each other. I, however, never claim that we are normal people in this household. So yeah, our honeymoon was to Antarctica. We joined a scientific expedition on an old um, refurbished Russian icebreaker ship. The scientists actually rented out some of the vacant um, cabins in the ship to interested tourists just to get some extra funding for their expedition. So we traveled to the uttermost south point of Argentina, to Ushuaia, and embarked from there onto this two-week exploration of Antarctica. And I can tell you, this is one of those once-in-a-lifetime adventures. I'm not going to tell you every detail because that would make an entire video just about Antarctica, but I can tell you the highlights. Not as cold as you think, until you go swimming, penguins are lovely but very smelly, and if you have one animal to fear, it is the leopard seal. Those are some nasty critters. So yes, this book is very, very special and I would be saving this one without a doubt. And since we are talking traveling, this book has become rather special to me. This is 150 bookstores you need to visit before you die. And it is just that, it does what it says on the cover. It is a selection of 150 unique, special, gorgeous, beautiful bookstores all around the world. Each entry comes with an address, how to get there, quick description, and again, beautiful photography. This is, for example, my own favorite bookstore here in Belgium, Ladites, in Antwerp, but it has bookstores all over the world. So each time we go on a family vacation or each time I'm traveling alone, uh, before I go, I just pick up this book and see if there is any interesting bookstores about uh, where I'm traveling. These are not the biggest bookstores. These are not your very massive uh, chain bookstores. They don't have the Waterstones. They don't have the Barnes and Nobles, you name it. But these are the special independent ones. Bookstores that are situated in a former church. Bookstores hidden away with a rich history. Bookstores that come with a unique design or bookstores that used to cater Ernest Hemingway. All of them are in here and if you love books, if you love bookstores and going to bookstores, then this is actually something you need to treat yourself to. Again, lovely coffee table book. Very fun to just browse through and see what magnificent bookstores there are about. And if you go traveling, just open it and look if there is something in the neighborhood for you. So yeah, there are 150 bookstores you need to see before you die by Elizabeth Stamp is absolutely coming with me. The next one is another book about books, but with a whole different kind of story. This is Book Talk by Aiden Chambers, and you might know Aiden Chambers as a YA author, as a middle grade author, but this is none of that. Before becoming a full-time author, Aiden Chambers was an English teacher, he was the school librarian, and he was obsessed with the idea of how to get children to read. How can we spark their interest in books, in reading, and how can we actually incorporate that in our lessons, in our education, without throwing people off? Without having these long lists of required reading of books that we as adults think children should read, 
and no kid ever wanted to read. This book was the inspiration for my own dissertation. When I finished my teacher degree, my degree in uh, both Dutch and English literature, as well as history, um, I wrote a dissertation on how to get children to read again. Instead of telling them what they should read, we should ask children what they like to read. Just as you, as a reader, come to Booktube for reading recommendations, there is nothing more powerful than a recommendation by a friend from your class. If they think it's good, you'll probably enjoy it as well. So this book and Agent Chambers absolutely inspired me to uh, pick the topic of my dissertation. The title officially was The Influence of Reading on the Social, Cognitive and Linguistic Development of Young Children. I know, quite a zinger. It was, it was a milestone. It was the end of an era and I still look back very fondly to this time. And if you have any interest in how to read to children, how to educate children about books, how to get your children or grandchildren or nieces and nephews to read again, then do look into Agent Chambers. Start with Book Talk, pick up the reading circle and go from there. So yeah, Agent Chambers is coming with me. Now for the next book, well, sometimes I don't want to read a classic. Sometimes I don't feel like a heavy, difficult, emotional literary fiction book. Sometimes I just want to sit down, have a cup of coffee and read uh, Calvin and Hobbes. These three gorgeously bound, encased books contain all of the Calvin and Hobbes comics that has ever been created by Will Lotterson. And I love them. They come in the original black and whites, they come in the later colored ones and this, this book is, is an absolute treat. You probably know Calvin and Hobbes. These are the stories of a rather cynical young boy and his story tiger, which is also his imaginary friend. They are funny, they are witty, but they are also emotional and beautiful and they actually have a message. These are the types of comics that you can enjoy both as a kid and as an adult. This is not highbrow literature and I couldn't care less. Calvin and Hobbes are absolutely being saved from the flames. And if you don't agree, then you're a monster. <laughs> now, one of the other books that I would save is something that I bought quite recently. These are the love letters um, that were written between Virginia Woolf and Vita Sackville-West, her friend, her lover, her inspiration, her muse. And I absolutely love these. This is, in fact, an historical document. But because these are letters written by two published authors, it is also a novel. It is poetry. It is the kind of letter that I would love to receive. And if you are a fan of Virginia Woolf, then this book is immensely interesting. It shows her inner thoughts, her inner feelings. You can read how her obsession with Vita grows, but sadly enough, it seems that the farther away Vita is, the bigger her love gets. But when she returns, things cool down again. This is a clash between two totally different personalities and two totally different lives and classes. This is not a big book, but it brings a lot to the table. If you have a love for literature, for history, and if you are a Virginia Woolf fan, then absolutely try to get one of these. Don't read it all at once, just read a few letters a day, savor them, think about them, let them live rent-free in your head, and you will absolutely enjoy and love this book. So yeah, this one is being saved. We saved eight books already, so I can only pick two more. And for this one, I think I will revisit my childhood. This is a Jules Verne's Wondrous World Omnibus. And I think I was about 10 and I was suffering from the flu. Weather outside was nice, everyone was playing outside and I was chained to the couch. Now, if I remember this right, one of the neighbors took pity on me and she bought me this book to keep me company. And it blew my mind. This book is a collection of stories that actually make up the Mysterious Island book. This is a story about the American Civil War and there is this group of soldiers that gets captured, they are imprisoned, but they manage to escape using a hot air balloon. They shipwreck on this mysterious island and they have nothing but a few tools and their wits and knowledge to survive. This was basically the A-Team, the Avengers Assemble. 
These were individuals, each with their own speciality, with their own background, with their own knowledge. And when they came together as a team, they managed to actually survive and even thrive out there. And if there was ever an adventure book that could capture the mind of a 10 year old boy, then this was the one. It also has one of the best cameos I've ever seen in uh, classical literature. And I'm not going to say which one. So yes, this book, The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne, absolutely kindled that love for reading, kindled that love for uh, possibly that Victorian literature uh, obsession I was talking about later on. And even up to this day, I still believe that if you want to read something by Jules Verne, don't go with um, 20,000 Leagues, don't go with Around the World in 80 Days, but pick up The Mysterious Island. I have not kept many books from my childhood, but I will absolutely always keep this one. Saving a piece of my childhood, The Mysterious Island by Jules Verne. And then the last book, the last one that I get to save from the All Devouring Flames is the tiniest. It is Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke. And again, this is a book that does what it says on the tin. It is a series of letters that uh, the author, Rainer Maria Rilke, wrote to a fan, to a younger a man who was aspiring to become a poet as well. And they contain advice. And although I never annotate my books and the idea of writing or highlighting or marking anything is absolute horror to me, I would be tempted to annotate this one. This is a very tiny treasure trove filled with gorgeous sentences, gorgeous language and actually very useful life advice. The questions that the young poet, the young uh, aspiring poet asks are very relatable. And he doesn't just ask about his career, he asks about life, about love, sexuality, about uh, how to be successful in life and the answers that he gets, the answers that Rainer uh, Maria Rilke writes uh, back to him are absolute gems. This book is inspiring. This is one of those books that anyone should read at least once in their 20s and maybe again once in their 40s. This book is very dear to me and I, I reread it often. Sometimes just a letter at a time. So as the last book that I would save from the flames, a little tome of life advice, Letters to a Young Poet by Rainer Maria Rilke. And now I have a challenge for you. If you could save one book, just one, which one would you save and why? Perhaps it is your all-time favorite book, perhaps it is a book that you thought was great, or perhaps it is something that is special to you. Let me know down below in the comments and we can talk about special books some more. Thank you for watching, leave a like, do subscribe, and in the meantime, should you want to browse my entire collection some more, that's possible. All you have to do is go to this video.